Hello everyone, my name is Jen Nolan and on behalf of Muscular Skeletal Australia, I'd like to warmly welcome you to our webinar on inflammatory forms of arthritis this evening. I would like to begin, however, by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which we are broadcasting, the Boomerang people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Muscular Skeletal Australia would like to sincerely thank Janssen Australia for their sponsorship of the this evening's webinar, which has enabled us to offer it free of charge. It's important to state, however, that our sponsor has had no editorial control over the content of tonight's webinar. If you haven't previously viewed Muscular Skeletal Australia's website, I strongly suggest you do so. In line with our focus on empowering consumers through education and support services, we have a wide range of information, videos, webinars, tools and services including our national helpline that's available via email and phone on 1800 263 265. Also, while you're visiting our website, check out our new online shop. It has a wide range of aids, gadgets, books, and other resources to assist you with your daily activities. Muscular Skeletal Australia's National Consumer Survey conducted in 2020, and which resulted in the report making the invisible visible, identified the need to raise community awareness about musculoskeletal conditions and what life is like for the millions of Australians living with these conditions. That's why on Sunday the 31st of October, Musculoskeletal Australia is running the first Rattle Your Bones Day. You can take part in the Rattle Your Bones Challenge and even win some great prizes, or you can simply send an online cheerio or message of support any time between now and the 31st of October. Check out our website, tell all your friends, family and colleagues and join in the fun as a way of raising community awareness of muscle, bone and joint conditions. I'd now like to introduce our presenter for this evening, Dr Marie Falatar. Marie is a clinical rheumatologist working in private practice in Melbourne with a special interest in psoriatic arthritis. She has worked in Australia and overseas. Marie has ongoing involvement in therapeutic clinical trials and has conducted investigated initiated research in psoriatic arthritis in the areas of imaging, genetics and clinical studies. I'll now hand over to Marie. Thanks very much, Marie. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Jen. So, um, you know, with regard to the questions, rest assured there'll be heaps and heaps of time for questions. So I'm not going to talk for a whole hour. Um, I'm going to talk for 30 minutes or less. And uh, so please do add your questions along the way and uh, we'll do our best to address them um, at the end. So um, you're not gonna have to listen to me going on for too long. Um, okay, so um, you've heard a bit about me. So I'm just a rheumatologist in Melbourne, Australia. So I've been working now for almost 20 years, which makes me pretty old. Um, but look, it's rheumat uh, rheumatology has been a really interesting area to work in. Um, because in the last 20 years, a lot of things have changed. So uh, I'll be mentioning those um, along the way, particularly some of the newer therapies. And, and there's a whole stack of research on everything going on, more and more. So um, just to briefly cover areas that I'm going to discuss are osteoarthritis, because it's really common and we all suffer from it to some extent. Um, inflammatory arthritis, because that's what I spend a lot of my time addressing um, at work as rheumatologists, and we uh, spend a lot of time prescribing drugs for these sorts of conditions. Um, there, there are many types of uh, other common arthritis out there. So there's gout. Um, and then I understand that there are a lot of COVID related issues for many of our patients, for the general community, for sure, and particularly for patients who might be on some of the drugs, which can work on the immune system. So there'll be lots of time to discuss that. So, um, you know, often when people come in to see me and they have uh, some issues with their joints, you know, one of the main things that I try and explain is whether they have um, wear and tear problems fundamentally, which is osteoarthritis, or whether there is inflammation going on. So I try and draw a little picture that looks something like this. Um, so to picture in your head uh, what a, a, usual, a regular joint looks like, um, it's bone and bone and a cartilage in between. So the cartilage is the cushion between the joints. 
um, much like a couch cushion or a bean bag. And the, um, the joint is lined by a membrane, which is again, very much like a glad wrap wrapped around a sandwich. That's my simple um, illustration. So bone, bone cartilage and the membrane. Now, many of us walk in, many of us in life develop osteoarthritis, which is the wear and tear problem where unfortunately we lose cartilage. So these pictures show that very nicely where um, unfortunately that nice thick cushion which should be wrapped around the bone um, becomes very thin. So, you know, these are like tires that have become bald or a road that you, develops potholes along the way. So for instance, Somebody who's 55 years old who comes in and says, my knee's been hurting for six months or my hip's been hurting for six months. And an x-ray shows that the there is actually quite a lot of wear and tear and, and understandably they wonder how that came about in such a short space of time. So the answer is it actually doesn't happen in a short space of time. It tends to happen very slowly over a period of years. So it is very much like uh, developing a couple of potholes, maybe when you're 30 or 35 or 40, and then very slowly those potholes get bigger and bigger and bigger until the road washes away. So that's very much what happens with osteoarthritis. And fortunately or unfortunately, we don't experience the pain necessarily at the beginning. Um, our body is coping, it has a really good coping mechanism. So despite all these bits in us that are wearing out, including our brains, we somehow manage to keep functioning. So then there's rheumatoid arthritis. So many people come with swollen joints. So in, room, in something like rheumatoid arthritis, which is a very typical type of inflammatory arthritis, um, that membrane, that glad wrap around the joint, um, it gets very swollen. So normally that membrane produces just a bit of lubricant fluid, a bit of grease and oil. And usually that grease and oil is fairly well maintained in osteoarthritis, although it does drop out a little. Um, in rheumatoid arthritis, unfortunately, there's lots of inflammation going on in that membrane. So it gets, it's very red and swollen in there and um, an extra fluid leaks out, hence um, having swollen joints. So to talk a bit more about osteoarthritis, which I've started to do already, um, it's definitely something that uh, affects really everyone. Because if you grab a, even if you x-rayed a 50 year old like me from head to toe, um, you would find lots of areas that are starting to show some wear and tear in cartilage. So the more you look, the more you see. Um, in a 60 or 70 year old, you'd be pushed to find anyone who has absolutely normal knee cartilage. Normally by then, there will be some signs of potholes happening, some signs of that wear and tear. Um, and one of the tragedies still in 2021 is that with that cartilage breaking down, it just does not repair. So repair means it would have to regrow, fix itself. And you know, people come in and say, can you fix my arthritis? And very sadly, with osteoarthritis, we can't do that. It doesn't mean nothing can be done um, at all to help, but um, in terms of actually fixing it, and that, that is making it like new, um, unfortunately, we just can't do that. So um, there is no medication that's proven. Um, there is no surgery. Uh, sometimes people have these clean out surgeries with the, um, it gets called a clean out surgery, isn't quite a clean out surgery, um, where surgeons go in and they might chop off bits of the edge that have frayed or torn. Um, but that does not fix the problem because it doesn't actually bring back the cartilage, doesn't actually help it to grow back. So um, there are many, you know, there are many products on the shelf with the chemists that say it helps, this helps arthritis or that helps arthritis, glucosamine fish oils. Unfortunately, when they say that, um, they're not actually saying that they can make cartilage regrow. There's, as a bit of an advertising quirk, they're Im implying that to make you buy the product. Um, in the fine print, it says, you know, might, might help pain. You know, that's anybody's guess. Um, but does it actually make the cartilage regrow? No. So, um, so just some pictures. Now, <clears throat> in a normal 
in a normal knee. Um, so this is an X-ray of a fairly normal knee joint with again bone, the tibia and femur, shin bone. And on an X-ray, we would expect a certain amount of space between the joint to indicate that there is um, a healthy amount of cartilage. Um, and this, unfortunately, is what happens when you've lost a lot of that cartilage. You've lost the cushion, the tire has gone flat, the couch cushions disappeared, all the beans have left the bean bag, and then it's just totally flat. And so then you really are, at this point, this is very bad, and, and it's getting to bone on bone. Um, many especially middle-aged women come in and they have osteoarthritis on their fingers. They have finger pain, they're worried that they might have rheumatoid and they ask, is there anything I can do about it, doctor, to try and prevent it from getting worse? So um, in the hands, osteoarthritis is, uh, occurs in the fingers across these joints, um, not so much across the knuckles, and it often does occur at the bottom of the thumb, so round about there. Um, not so much around the wrist. So again, if you grab a 55 year old female, um, knobbly fingers are something you would commonly see, um, but not at the knuckles and not at the wrist. And this type of arthritis is extremely common. We tend to inherit it and it tends to not cripple people. So by that, I mean, um, yes, it can cause some pain and discomfort. Sometimes that only lasts for a few weeks or months, um, but, very often the pain kind of fizzles out and uh, there are many 70 year old people that do lots of knitting and lots of other tasks and they have knobbly fingers but it doesn't really bother them and doesn't really restrict what they're doing maybe a little bit of fine work threading needles gets a bit tricky but this is not typically very disabling and crippling cripple, crippling um, very occasionally people get a nasty aggressive form of this but that that's not as common so osteoarthritis hands, osteoarthritis knees, very, very, very common in most of the population. So again, x-ray to show how things progress slowly. Um, so normal, um, good joint space. <clears throat> and then um, as we progress through to more severe disease, the, that space between the bones gets less and less with time until you get a crummy joint like that. So, um, what um, in terms of in terms of regular uh, and I just no I think I'll go I think I'll move along to inflammatory arthritis before I come back to what we do. Um, okay, so just by contrast, um, inflammation arthritis. So inflammation arthritis can can affect children. It can affect eight year olds, and it often can occur out of the blue. In other words, someone who's seventy that's had a bad knee might say, you know, I've had this bad knee for a long time. And I know that I can't walk five kilometers as easily as I used to, but all of a sudden things have changed and I get up in the morning, I get out of bed and I'm very stiff and sore. And that's really been for the last four weeks. And it seems to be affecting my hands, my knees, my feet. And then that, you know, that, that makes us sit up and think, oh, this person might have inflammation going on in the joints. So middle age is, is a common age, again, to experience a new rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis. Um, but sometimes people who are well treated, you know, may have no signs of disease. So you might be sitting next to somebody or in the queue behind somebody who looks perfectly normal, but actually has rheumatoid arthritis because the drugs are keeping them well. Or their inflammation might be mild enough that, you know, it, it's not really easily seen to somebody. Um, you know, I, I, if you're a professional and you grab their joints and you start squeezing and prodding, then, you know, maybe I can tell that they're a bit inflamed, but it might not be incredibly obvious. So sometimes it does get missed by um, busy people, by physios, by GPs. Um, you know, it might not be might not be recognised. So in terms of what it looks like, younger person's hands, these joints are swollen. Um, Middle-aged person's hands, these are, this is that typical distribution of osteoarthritis, these joints and these joints. Okay, so a common type of inflammatory arthritis is psoriatic arthritis and rheumatoid. So I'll talk a little bit about those because the drugs that we use to treat them are quite similar. Um, so psoriasis is actually fairly common in the population. Um, about 3% of people suffer from psoriasis and a third of people with psoriasis will often develop inflamed joints at some time in their lives. So they may not recognize it. Sometimes it gets missed if it's mild. 
um, you know, when it affects many joints, then, you know, that person is suffering and they're going to be knocking on the doctor's door until they get heard. But, um, and the swollen joints of psoriatic arthritis can be, sometimes it is just one knee, or sometimes it can be lots of joints in the hands and feet. Um, as to when it occurs, so again, fairly common in middle age, sometimes, sorry, most of the time, psoriasis happens first and the arthritis happens second, about 10 years later. Occasionally, both occur at the same time. And then sometimes people get arthritis and they don't have any psoriasis till later on. Or even having a family member with psoriasis. So watch out for those that do. Um, actually genetically seems to make you more prone to get um, psoriatic arthritis. So if you go to the rheumatologist and you've got swollen hands and swollen knees and you say, well, my father or my mother has psoriasis, then the rheumatologist is going to think, well, maybe you're somebody that actually has um, psoriatic arthritis. So psoriasis can look uh, different uh, in uh, can look uh, slightly different. Um, it's typically a scaly red rash, typically on the outside of elbows and knees. Very common in the scalp. Hairdressers are very good at picking it up. Um, sometimes it's nasty red like that, but not so common. And sometimes it affects the nails. So when um, a rheumatologist looks at your nails, they're not trying to read your future. They um, might be looking for signs of psoriatic arthritis or of, of, of pitting in the nails. So these little divots in the nails is actually very typical of, um, of psoriasis. Um, so pictures. Now, so rheumatoid arthritis tends to be fairly symmetrical. So both hands, both feet, both knees. Psoriatic arthritis can be more one side than the other. So in this person, they've developed significant deformity of that right hand, but the left hand looks normal. So often with rheumatoid, the deformity would develop in both hands, but with psoriatic arthritis, it can be just on one side. Now, these days, hopefully with our drugs, we're, we're usually very, very good at helping to prevent that deformity. So um, that's not so common now to see that. Psoriatic arthritis causes swollen toes, um, swollen toes and fingers. And although this technical boring word is dactylitis, we call it sausage toes or sausage fingers because they look like little cocktail franks, as my colleague says. Um, so um, like this one and that one and that one. So pudgy toes like that. Someone showed me one of their toes that look like that today are very typical of psoriatic arthritis. Now, role of blood tests and x-rays. So um, again, blood tests do not really tell us everything about you. They're not a window to your soul. They're not a window to every diagnosis, but they tell us some important things. So um, they can give us an indication of severity. So if your inflammation readings are really high and we think you've got rheumatoid arthritis, then that tells us you've really got nasty aggressive disease. Just like with a roaring fire, the temperature is going to be hotter. Um, in rheumatoid arthritis, many of you will know that there are some antibodies that appear in the blood. So, and there are two antibodies that we now check for, rheumatoid factor CCP, but they are only positive 70% of the time. 30% of the time, they're negative. So we call these people seronegative arthritis. For psoriatic arthritis, there's no blood test. There's no blood test that we can do to say this person has psoriasis or this person has psoriatic arthritis. Um, so a lot of the time we make up our minds by listening to you, hopefully listening, examining, um, doing the relevant um, x-rays to see if there's any signs of bone damage. Um, fibromyalgia is um, a very common musculoskeletal condition, very common. Um, five to eight percent of women, maybe more, a smaller percentage of men. And that has to do with more generalised pain, um, it, very much an issue with mind-body interaction. I would describe it to people as having a chronic headache in the muscles. Um, you know, there's no blood test for a headache. You know, when we do brain scans, there's no, nothing there that says this person has a headache, but it's a very common issue. So I'm not going to talk much about fibromyalgia today. So treatment for all of these arthritis. So it comes, comes back to um, always main principle of looking after yourself. Um, my dentist has a sign on the wall that says there's nothing that I can do that um, effort from the um, person can't, that can replace the effort of the, um, of, of the person in front of me. So in other words, it's my job to look after my own teeth 
And if I don't do that properly, the dentist can't make them like you. So we've got to look after ourselves, um, always be in our best physical and emotional health, many aspects to that, easier said than done. Um, diet, exercise, keeping fit, aiming for a healthy body mass index. And then, and then there's the medications. So, um, so with, um, so I might just say with osteoarthritis, um, you know, many of our treatments are painkillers. So, um, uh, for instance, we, um, you know, we often discuss Panadol, anti-inflammatories. Um, there are some issues around anti-inflammatories that can have, can have some side effects. Panadol is generally remarkably safe and free of side effects. Um, and then coming down to some of the common medicines that are discussed with osteoarthritis, um, including things like glucosamine. So I'm not hearing patients ask me about glucosamine anywhere near as much as 10 years ago. There was a bit of a phase there that um, glucosamine was heavily promoted by the manufacturers. Um, and they make it sound like that glucosamine can improve your cartilage. Um, it is a component of cartilage. Um, but as a very clever person once said, it's like eating hair for baldness. It's like thinking that, well, I'm bald, but if I eat this hair, it'll go straight through and up to my scalp and shoot out where I want it to go. And very sadly, that doesn't happen with glucosamine. Similarly, um, there is a, an injection, sorry, that, yeah, there's an injection that we use to help people's pain. Um, so sometimes we use steroids, which can give you temporary pain relief. It is a bit like taking Panadol, um, except it can sometimes last for a few weeks or if you're lucky for a few months. Um, but that is temporary relief and certainly does not fix the cartilage. Um, we know that we can't do too many injections um, because that maybe can do some harm. So most rheumatologists would not use those cortisone injections, certainly not um, every every few months, every year, that would be a rare thing to do. Um, and uh, so there is a, an injection called Synvisc. Um, Synvisc is a hyaluronic acid injection, which is um, hyaluronic acid is also a component of cartilage. It's part of that thick fluid um, material that's naturally occurring in joints. Um, and that... Um, um, that uh, injecting that into osteoarthritis joints interestingly seems to help pain. It's, it's a, a, an agent that was used in racehorses in the 80s and 90s. Um, we started to use it in humans. It's been shown to be very safe, rarely causes side effects, and sometimes it can give people some lasting relief for a few months. However, unfortunately, it is um, in, uh, expensive. Unfortunately, it costs about $500 these days. It's through a pharmacist and to, certainly to be discussed with your doctor before you um, order it. Now, moving on to um, um, uh, moving on to oops, um, things like inflammatory arthritis, our treatment approach is very much to A, try and make your life comfortable, reduce pain, and we, we try and do that by changing the disease. We're trying to tone down the disease. We're trying to put out the fire with relevant treatments um, and also change the conditions so that the fire doesn't come back. So, um, so prevent and preventing joint damage is really critical. And fortunately, we have actually a large range of drugs for rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis. So that's those inflammatory conditions. Um, that, are, that are actually very, very good at preventing this damage. So some common ones that the audience will be familiar with might be methotrexate. Um, we, um, we have leflunamide, slazapar and plaquenil. And then we have a whole swag of newer drugs. They're not so new because they've been available in Australia since around 2002. Um, and they are called biologic agents. I might skip past that. So um, biologic agents, um, these medical treatments um, have often been able to uh, really improve the quality of people's lives. Um, so many of these drugs are actually given by self-injection. So they're like, it's like a pen that you put into your skin. So in the tummy or thigh, they might be once a week or once a fortnight or once a month or sometimes every two or three months. 
And uh, although it's it doesn't seem great to inject yourself, one of the sort of benefits of that is that you're not taking a tablet that's making you sick or nauseous or diarrhea. Um, and, and they're often very good at improving fatigue and it, it often has allowed people to, 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 to take less tablets on a daily basis to manage their arthritis. So some of these drugs, um, TNF agents we've used are Enbrel, Humira, they are common ones, Symphony, Remicade. Um, then we have a couple that are more specific for rheumatoid and we have a few that are specific for psoriatic arthritis. And, and actually remarkably, these drugs are fantastic for skin psoriasis. So uh, a patient comes in and they happen to have uh, quite bad skin psoriasis and some swollen joints. We can actually offer them something that really might address both, which is quite um, quite satisfying. Um, and, uh, and now we also have some oral agents, um, tablets, which are, of new, are the newest kids in the block. Um, so we have Gelgens, uh, Rinvoc more recently, um, Illumiant for rheumatoid, and these two agents are available for both psoriatic arthritis and rheumatoid. And, and as tablets, they have been remarkably effective as well, you know, with some potential side effects to be, you know, things to watch out for. Um, so Lastly, um, I will just mention gout again, because it's very common. Uh, it's, a, it's a common lifestyle issue, um, especially in our Western world. Um, it is something that affects men more than women. It does affect us more when we get, as we get older. Um, it's very uncommon for a female before menopause to get gout, just biologically, that's the way it is. Um, so, and you don't have to be an alcoholic to have gout. Um, so gout is a form of arthritis caused by too much uric acid building up in the joints. And, and people, many people know it as something that causes really acute pain and swelling. So that means you go to bed feeling okay, you wake up in the morning and your foot is killing you, or you might wake up in the night and it feels like it's on fire and they have to pull the sheets off because even the sheets touching it hurts so much and they really can't walk. So it varies from that to being a bit more subtle. Um, gout can affect knees, ankles, feet, elbows, hands, doesn't tend to affect shoulders and hips. And sometimes it can be a lingering, creeping thing that sort of builds up over time. So um, this stuff, uric acid, so we all have it. Um, we can't totally get rid of it. Um, it's like a waste product of metabolism. So um, it's something that it is being filtered through our system every single day. And it's when our body gets less efficient at filtering it and the levels build up in the blood that it kind of spills over into the joints. And when we look under the microscope, we actually see these needle-like crystals. So they're like little grains of sand, except they're in this long needle form. And they creep into the joint from the bloodstream and then they just you know, they light a fire and there's a ton of inflammation that happens as a result of that. So why do we get it? Um, unfortunately, our lavish lifestyles uh, really strongly contribute to it. It's very much about our diet and lifestyle. So when we're overweight, just being overweight makes you more prone to gout. Um, the type of diet you have. So um, yes, high alcohol definitely makes a difference. But if you're on a very high protein diet, so purines are a component of, of um, proteins, then it does put you more at risk of gout. So if you're 50 or 60 and you're a male and you decide to go all protein, um, and you, know, you can put yourself at risk of developing gout. Um, certain foods are more commonly associated. So if you like your a steak every night for dinner, especially with a beer um, and Coke, then you know, you're gonna be in trouble. Um, things like liver um, and those organ meats, kidneys, make you more prone to gout. Sugary drinks, because fructose, now fructose is a sugary substance which is um, very commonly used in America as a sweetener. Um, and so it's in many, many of our products as a sweetener. High fructose can make you more prone to gout. So how do you deal with it? Well, ideally, um, if you improve your lifestyle, you make yourself more resilient to gout, diet, weight loss, regular exercise, really do very much help. Um, 
So um, these are some pictures of what gout can look like. So I showed you the photo of an inflamed toe. Now, as I said, sometimes over time, these deposits of crystals creep up, creep, um, and they, they literally build up like a mountain of sand, building a sand castle. And, uh, and you get these very white looking deposits through the skin. So when somebody walks in and they've got these whitish deposits over their joints, especially elbows, fingers and toes, that's pretty much lay down the zare gout. And we call those lumps toe fine. So um, apart from lifestyle things, um, if you have chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, it makes you more prone to gout. It's also associated with kidney damage. So one of the things hopefully your rheumatologist will tell you is not only are you helping your joints by improving your gout, but um, um, you're also actually helping your kidneys and your heart in the long run because gout is very strongly associated with heart disease. Um, so certain medications that are used for blood pressure like fluid tablets make you more prone to gout. We now have a couple of very um, effective, um, effective um, treatments for gout that include allopurinol um, and fibroxostat. Um, fibroxostat is relatively new. It's been around for six or seven years. We've had allopurinol for decades. These are two very effective drugs which really bring down your blood uric acid level um, and which then if you stick with it, it's very effective at helping to prevent um, episodes of gout. And if you don't, then you can get nasty damage in the bones like this. So this is the, the crystals in the bone. So whereas the joint looks should look nice and smooth. Um, this is this is like a little Pac-Man bite hole, munch hole. The um, the bones literally been eaten into by those grains of sand, and so this is a very typical gout damage joint. So really quite nasty. But remember, it can also damage your kidneys. Okay, so take a deep breath. So lastly, um, I'm, people might have questions about COVID. So I actually, I might not say very much about COVID, but I, um, people will have heard a lot by now. Um, but just to say, I'm very open to answering questions about um, um, what, I, what I can tell you about the virus, vaccine op options, um, interaction of disease and treatment um, with COVID and vaccination. So, um, okay, so maybe I'll just say a few things. So, um, People may be aware that, you know, COVID, um, it's a peculiar virus um, and it, it gets put in the category of this SARS virus because um, it's a virus that can induce a strong immune reaction, so uh, which does not happen with the average cold or flu. For instance, um, when you contract COVID, you know, you, you may or may not be unwell for a few days. And then typically it's around day seven, eight, nine or 10 that people go downhill. And that happens in the people, not in everybody, but in the people where the, the immune system starts to overreact to the virus. And that overreaction floods the body with inflammation, floods the lungs with fluid, makes people very unwell, can't breathe, intensive care. So people decline, can decline very quickly. Um, interestingly then, when it comes to treatment options, not only has um, well, vaccines been explored to prevent it, um, antiviral drugs, now we don't have many antiviral drugs. So you'll, you'll know that from the common cold or flu, you know, we, we, the, the drugs available are not very effective at blocking viruses. We're much better at blocking bacteria than we are blocking viruses. But some of our rheumatology drugs, some of these fancy biologics that I mentioned earlier, particularly this category of TNF inhibitors, happen to be very good at helping to block that immune overreaction. So it was very clear in the early days of um, COVID last year in um, New York and Italy, where it was not the rheumatology patients that were flooding intensive care units at all. In fact, they were staying away. They were not there. And it from from the statistics, because there are millions of people worldwide on these drugs, um, these rheumatology drugs, etanercept, adalimumab, um, actually give you 60% protection from getting severe COVID. So they're not gonna prevent you from catching the virus, but if you do catch COVID, 
then it gives you 60% protection from getting severe illness and death. So that's pretty impressive. And one of our drugs, Actemra, um, which is a different category of drug, but also helps to block this, is actually used in the treatment of COVID. So there's, and there's a shortage of that at the moment. So, um, okay, so that's what I'll say, and, I, and I'll leave it open for questions. So we've got 20, 25 minutes, and um, we'll see how we go. <clears throat> thanks, thanks very much, uh, Marie, because uh, there's quite a few, you know, um, uh, different types of, uh, of uh, inflammatory arth arthritis that you've covered, you know, uh, well within, within your presentation, so that's great. One point you certainly made in your presentation, which came very much through our National Consumer Reserve Survey report last year as well, was the fact that um, with a lot of uh, inflammatory forms of arthritis, it, you know, it's not very visible. Um, and that certainly came through from our survey report that a lot of people felt that uh, people didn't know that they had conditions because they didn't look like they um, had, had physical, um, you know, uh, problems with their hands and feet and so on. Um, whereas, uh, you know, with other forms of arthritis and so on, it might be more obvious. We've had a couple yeah. of questions come through and I ask if everyone could um, submit any questions they have in the, uh, in the question box so that we can work through the questions uh, in the time that we have left. Um, someone has said, Marie, that it's hard to maintain a positive frame of mind when someone is in a lot of pain. Um, what, what do you suggest, and, and particularly in relation to exercise, the role of exercise in reducing pain? Probably in relation no. to osteoarthritis, I suppose. Sure. So, um, look, such a such a common question. So, um, I, I guess you know when you're in front of the doctor asking about pain, you know we we are trying to categorise where is that pain coming from. You know, is the pain coming from a knee that's really worn out, um, in which case we're dealing with osteoarthritis. Are we dealing with uncontrolled inflammation, which means that I'm not doing my job properly at putting out the fire and getting rid of that inflammation, or are there are there other factors? So, for instance. Um, fibromyalgia is very common in arthritis sufferers. So person sitting in front of me might have rheumatoid arthritis or psoriatic arthritis or lupus, but they may also have fibromyalgia. So fibromyalgia is very commonly that all over pain. Um, and, you know, so that might need to be addressed in a different way. Um, and then look, we, we very much, it's, it's known and understood that the brain affects pain the brain is the biggest, you know, a pain organ. So what's going on in our lives, um, stress, anxiety, uncertainty, depression, um, all feeds into increasing pain. Um, so, you know, coming back to the, the general approach, um, diet, health and lifestyle, um, keeping us, uh, keeping ourselves as healthy emotionally and physically um, uh, as possible is really important. Um, you know, exercise just has so many benefits. Um, so it has immediate benefits. If you've got a bad knee, it strengthens the you strengthen the leg, and and the knee is happier. Um, but it also has some metabolic effects. You know, when we exercise, we sleep better. Um, you know, even our bowels are better. It's all very weird, but it happens, you know, because there are so many hormones circulating through us that, um, and, you know, exercise improves mood and it's been shown that it improves depression. So many, many aspects to discuss with pain. Mm. Uh, and Marie, another question. Um, now, in relation to your one of your last slides there with regards to people who are on certain drugs actually having a uh, a bit of a safety uh, net with regards to if they did catch COVID. There's a question, are those on immu Im immunosuppressant medication like methotrexate more susceptible to severe COVID symptoms? Now with methotrexate, where does that stand in relation to sure. COVID? Sure. So no, yeah, good, good, great question. So um, methotrexate is so commonly used. So the reassuring thing there, um, and is that there were there is a, a huge reg international registry of data. So some uh, some clever doctors, one of them in a rheumatologist in Queensland, helped initiate this database where patients could feed their information, and doctors around the world could feed their information of their patients who had experienced COVID. And so we actually know very clearly that methotrexate does not put you at a higher risk of COVID complications or death. It just does not. 
Now, um, it, um, and it, it's actually not regarded by infectious diseases doctors as a severe immune suppressant. And that's because at the doses that we use, um, it's, it's not a, a bad immune suppressant. You know, from 40 years of use in rheumatology and other autoimmune diseases, it is not the drug that kills people, puts people into hospital, um, you know, with infections every year and crashes their immune system. Otherwise, we would not still be using it. And actually, methotrexate prolong has been shown to prolong the life of people with rheumatoid, lessen heart attacks, etc. So methotrexate, very clear information. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Bray. Um, uh, if, with someone with someone who might may not have an obvious bout of gout, uh, but they do have an elevated uric acid level, should they be treated? Um, you know, if they're displaying a, an elevated level of uric acid. Yep, another good, good question. So um, no, the short answer is no. Um, really common to have high uric acid. So most of us over 50 or 60 will, will often have a high uric acid at some point. Or if you measured it every day of the week, you know, you'll, you'll find a high reading somewhere. Um, so we actually only treat if you have clinical features of gout. Now, until, until a time comes where we have research to say that we should just lower uric, uric acid for the hell of it. But at the moment, um, the information that we have says only if that person manifests features of gout um, or maybe if they have kidney disease but then that's up to the kidney doctor um, but yeah only if you have features of gout you get treated so just having a high uric acid doesn't diagnose you as having gout. Mm -hmm. And um, you mentioned before glucosamine um, someone's also asking about the benefit of other over-the-counter supplements such as fish oil, turmeric, et cetera. Yeah. What, what, what's your comment about, about uh, over-the-counter over sure. supplements? Yeah, so thank you. I neglected to, to discuss fish oils. It was in one of my slides. The, um, so fish oils are uh, an, a natural um, fat of omega-3. They are the natural fats of seafood, and, and they are really good for us. Um, so, uh, for instance, the Mediterranean diet is often – described as the best diet for us. It's good for inflammation, it's good for our weight, it's good for our heart. And, and, and Mediterranean diet is very high in fish and seafood. So unfortunately, us Westerners, we tend to go more with red meat, etc. cetera. But um, high seafood is um, been shown to, can, can reduce pain. So um, in order to get reduction of pain, you tend to have to take reasonably high-ish doses. So many of the capsules over the counter are 1,000, 1,500 milligrams. But, you know, you might have to take six or 7,000 milligrams a day of fish oils to get some reasonable pain relief. But you can test it out on yourself and take the supplements for um, three or four weeks and see if there's a change. You know, you probably, you have to do it for more than a day to get it to um, have a difference. Um, it's really good for heart disease. Um, and can be protective for heart disease. So Eskimos eat fish and they don't get much heart disease. And that's how actually it was surmised that, you know, it might be beneficial. Um, and it um, doesn't protect the cartilage, unfortunately, no, not that we know of. Um, so, yeah. Okay. And um, with regards to, um, does, uh, does rheumatoid arthritis lead to osteoarthritis often? Um, and does osteoarthritis present like RA, for example, in the hands? Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, yeah. Um, so rheumatoid arthritis can, but doesn't often lead to osteoarthritis. So it's only if um, your that inflammation gets really bad and it actually has rheumatoid inflammation can eat into the bone and, and therefore damage the cartilage. Um, so hopefully the, the person and the rheumatologist don't allow that to happen by treating it appropriately. So we, we would, um, although it was very common in the 90s, is to see people with lots and lots of joint damage. We really don't see that very much now at all. Um, so it can, but it shouldn't, So because it can be treated. And, um, and second question, does rheumatoid and osteo look the same? Look, sometimes it does look a bit the same. So if you've got swollen, if you've got a few swollen fingers here, um, then sometimes I can't immediately tell whether that's like a rheumatoid thing or an osteo thing. Sometimes time will tell, sometimes x-rays help. Sometimes we just track the person for a period of months and see if anything else is developing. Mm. Um, Maria, a question around ankylosing spondylitis. 
um, and disease progression with AS, is it detrimental to delay commencing biologics? Um, if it's considered that symptoms can be managed with anti-inflammatories alone? Um, so um, the short answer is yes, we think, because um, the, the, the medications that I mentioned, the TNF inhibitors like Engrel Humira, they're the ones commonly used, um, have really been shown to make an enormous difference to ankylosing spondylitis. And um, the consensus is that we are seeing a, a prevention of damage. So, you know, in the old days, someone with typical severe ankylosing spondylitis would get fused and would get nasty punched spine. And uh, the, you know, drugs like methotrexate are not great at all for, for um, ankylosing spondylitis, but these newer biologics actually really are. So um, it's, you know, again, individual case, if you're at the milder spectrum of disease, maybe you um, can be managed well with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, something to be discussed with your um, um, rheumatologist who can advise you about the severity of your illness. Mm. And a question, um, is fatigue common with inflammatory arthritic conditions? Yep, um, fatigue is common in life, isn't it? So, um, but there's no question um, that when you have active disease, people definitely feel more tired and they can rec and they um, recognise that, yep. Mm. Um, and a question going back to osteoarthritis, um, can a 60-year-old a, a plus male continue to do heavy work, moving wheelbarrows, et cetera, if, if he's um, got osteoarthritis? Um, and does this work increase pain? I suppose um, it depends sorry. on the individual. Does, does his work increase pain? Is that the question? If he has osteoarthritis, can he continue, continue to do uh, sort of heavy, I suppose, physical work? Um, yes, yeah, Jen, as you said, depends on the individual. So, um, uh, try and make a long answer short. You know, we, I, I try to give the impression that, you know, as we're all getting older, we're all developing osteoarthritis. If you x-ray me from head to toe, I'll have some bits that are wearing out. Um, I don't do physical work, but the just by being alive, we get wear and tear. That's the short answer. So again, you never see a 60 or 70 year old that has zero wear and tear, never, never. So um, look, some individuals are better at coping with it than others. The healthier they are, the stronger their muscles are, the less load they're carrying, the more easily their body can handle it. Um, so, and some people just aren't, you know, aren't good at handling all that. So um, it, it's very much an individual thing. Mm. Um, why does seronegative arthritis cause hand, is it Rat Raynaud's, Raynaud's phenomenon, and also nerve pain and numbness? Okay, um, so, okay, probably a couple of separate issues there. So Raynaud's is uh, what we call um, the, the blood flow uh, cutting out of the extremities, so very often fingers and toes. Um, and Raynaud's can it actually commonly happens in things like lupus and scleroderma. So I didn't, didn't mention those tonight really, but um, they are autoimmune connective tissue diseases. So we actually don't see them very much in um, things like rheumatoid or psoriatic arthritis. Um, and although Raynaud's can be common in the general population. So a certain percentage, especially females, a certain percentage of teenage girls, young women, just get Raynaud's in winter, you know, triggered by the cold. Um, so it's not, the majority of people with seronegative arthritis would not get Raynaud's. So um, yeah, that was that. And there was, what was the other part of the question? Oh, just, um... Uh, just the nerve pain and numbness, and also would would uh, would it the would it settle down with um with DMARDs or other medications? Right. Okay. So um, nerve pain and numbness in the hand is very commonly carpal tunnel syndrome, um, and the um, the carpal tunnel is a little section in the wrist. Um, it's a little space, and in that space runs lots of things. So it's like a tunnel that gets crowded. And when there's inflammation there, um, the nerve doesn't like it. It's like crossing your legs for too long or leaning on your elbow. Um, the nerve complains after a while. So if you get rid of the inflammation, yes, definitely, then the nerve um, issues can improve. Not always. Um right, okay. And just, um, just someone asking any more sort of... Um items of any more information around AS? 
Marie, like anything other, you can provide advice around for those who have ankylosing spondylitis? Okay, so um, yeah, look, if there's someone out there with ankylosing spondylitis, I would really encourage you to go and see a rheumatologist. So um, our experience has been interesting because it's only um, rheumatoid arthritis, we started to get better at treating in the 90s um, because we had a couple of uh, better drugs come our way, but those drugs, methotrexate, leflunamide, were really did nothing much for Anxpond. And then um, when these newer drugs, those injectables, those biologics came along in the 2000s, um, we slowly started seeing, we call it, you know, these people, poor people, suffering people coming out of the woodwork. They'd understandably given up with doctors because they, you know, we didn't have anything much for them. They knew they were just stuck with taking anti-inflammatories. And over the years, you know, occasionally someone comes out and says, well, I heard there was something for angst bond, you know. And, um, and, and, you know, I saw somebody actually, and so we had a lot of those in the first 10 years and then started to dwindle out, but I actually saw somebody not so long ago who was like that. And, you know, he was somebody who was 50 or 60 and who'd been living with this for a long time. So um, really would encourage discussion because the, the drugs – the medicines can give you remarkably improved quality of life if ankylosing spondylitis is what's causing your symptoms. Mm -hmm. And in relation to COVID and now the fact that there's a third dose of vaccine recommended for immune suppressed um, people, do you know what the, um, the recommendation of time between the second and the third, the booster dose is? Um, yeah, so I know, re relevant question. So um, we, we, a few of us have been discussing this. So um, the current, it, it's it's two to six months after your last dose at the moment. And the recommendations are for severely immune suppressed people. So um, now methotrexate is on that list, but um, methotrexate at doses higher than we use. So um, if you look at the details, it says uh, greater than 0.4 milligram per kilo and so when we give patients 10 to 20 milligrams a week, you know, that, that's generally less than 40% of their body weight. Um, so, um, so methotrexate at the doses that we use is not considered severe immune suppression. Most of our drugs um, don't interfere significantly with vaccine response. Um, some of them can a little bit. Um, a couple of our drugs are particularly at risk. So uh, rituximab, Mapthira, we don't use so much, but um, that is a drug which definitely can interfere with vaccine response. So, so that group would be considered immune suppressed enough to get a, to get a third dose. Um, so many of our patients are not considered severely enough immune suppressed um, to get a third dose at the moment. So, you know, we're thinking, they're thinking more of um, people with severe lung disease, people that have been undergoing cancer treatment in the last six months, um, transplant patients that are on a really different group of drugs to our patients, you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. And Marie, how common is vitamin B12 deficiency in people with arthritis? Mm, um, I really have no idea. Um, percentage wise, but you know, I just know it's out there. So, you know, it's it's gonna be less than 5%, but it's not necessarily more common in with our patients, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, in relation to, um, for people who are living with RA and fibromyalgia um, and who struggle to complete daily chores, um, is there much help available? I guess that's a, Good question, but I, I suppose it very much depends on local services. Um, uh, so, yeah, any comment? What what would you advise your patients in relation to what help is available for people who struggle co to complete daily um, activities of of you know that they need to do in their lives? Okay. Um, so, you know, so often with um, people suffering, I try and we try and nut it down to sort of three areas: health. Um, so emotional health, physical health and sleep. So, um, you know, you look at the relevant factors in your life that are affecting your emotional health and you see if that's something that needs to be attended to. So, you know, you might go to a psychologist to help you deal with anxiety, stress that's, you know, feeding into the pain um, or, or issues, traumatic issues that have happened in life that often can precipitate fibromyalgia, which unfortunately is often the case. Um, physical exercise issues. So, you know, if you struggle to exercise, then it, you know, hopefully you can find resources. Not so easy with COVID lockdowns, but um, physiotherapists, exercise physiologist um, groups, you know, are, um, 
Jen's um, Arthritis Musculoskeletal Australia um, to, uh, you know, provide sort of help, support, encouragement to improve fitness. Um, sleep is really important, so maybe talking to your GP there, but often when we improve our emotional health and physical health, sleep improves and then everything gets better. Mm. Thanks, Marie. And um, is it common to develop bony spurs with psoriatic arthritis? Um, it, it, yes, it is. Um, the most common cause of um, spurs are, are um, actually just osteoarthritis. And, um, and often people that um, are a bit heavy, um, have a higher body weight, um, are much more prone actually to developing big spurs, especially around elbows, shoulders, um, Achilles, around the feet. So they're not, they're not exclusively a sign of psoriatic arthritis, no. Mm -hmm. um, and another question in relation to um, the, uh, the booster shot for COVID. Um, a query about um, should a, should someone delay their methotrexate and or Humira in order to make an appropriate level of antibodies? Mm -hmm. um, so Humira is one of our biologic TNF drugs. Many of those drugs actually do not interfere with vaccination response because those drugs were tested with um, flu vaccines, Pneumovax vaccines and um, and you know they, they had a great response even so it doesn't interfere with COVID, Humira. Methotrexate maybe a little. So um, recommendation is either uh, so okay yeah that can be a long answer but um, sometimes we say to stop it for a week or two um, after, after not before after the COVID shot. But, but if you have very active disease, so if you've got lots of active rheumatoid at the moment, then stopping methotrexate for a week or two without consulting your rheumatologist is not the right thing to do. Because when your immune system is fighting hard against your rheumatoid, then that actually blocks the response to your vaccination as well. So it's not just the drugs, it's the disease. And often having people in a very, in remission is actually the best way to get people to have an immune response. So it's not, it, it hasn't been straightforward advice for everybody. So it's been challenging for doctors to communicate that. But please be reassured that if you've had your COVID vaccine and if you have not stopped the methotrexate for a week or two, please don't lose any sleep because you, you know, you're still very, very much protected by the vaccinations. We are not seeing people in hospital who were on methotrexate, got a vaccine and it didn't work. You know, they're not the people filling up intensive care units. It's clearly, clearly the unvaccinated people. So methotrexate, despite being on methotrexate, you still would have likely had a very good and effective um, uh, COVID response. And, you know, we're just talking about tweaking. We're just talking about that, you know, 5% of just trying to get the max out of the vaccines. Mm. And um, uh, a question I've heard before, Marie, how much does weather play a part in inflammatory arthritis? Well, there's just as many people in R Queensland as Tasmania with rheumatoid arthritis and osteoarthritis. So that about says it all. Um, subjectively, we feel different with different weathers, So, but it's technically it's not going to make your disease process worse. What's going on in the body physically isn't going to be doesn't seem to be actually affected by the, the temperature outside. So we know that from areas around the world. Yep, okay. Um, so uh, as uh, you said, you talked before about the Mediterranean diet as being having good properties for sort of anti-inflammation and so on. Um, uh, also, just basically, um, what, what, what comment have you got about the influence of a healthy gut? You know, generally, just uh, I guess a okay. healthy gut and yes. digestive system. Mm. Any yeah, so I, I imagine that person is asking maybe about um, the microbiome is a very trendy thing to talk about now, um, and that's talking about the bacteria in your gut. Um, look, I guess in general, um, we, we need more detail to understand it all more. Um, many people come in, and, and, and I myself, we, we, we mostly want a simple solution. Um, if I just skip tomatoes or if I just don't have gluten, surely everything will be better. But actually, a lot of it comes down down to you've got to come back to that whole general health. Am I really eating well? You know, every day, am I putting into my gut really healthy foods and not trashy foods? 
Am I looking after diet and exercise? Very sadly, our immune system loves a low calorie diet. So for those of us that love food, that sucks um, because unfortunately being skinnier does make your immune system happier. So being skinnier is a whole lot harder than just skipping the odd tomato and piece of bread, but that's actually unfortunately what we should be aiming for to have a healthy gut. And look, one very last question. We're right, we know actually we're right on finishing time. So look, um, uh, there's obviously, thanks so much, Marie, with regards to really during that question time, you really uh, fired off lots of an answers to many questions. Um, and I'm apologies for people who have posed a question. We just haven't been able to fit it in this evening. Um, look, thank you, Marie, for a very generous and a very broad, a comprehensive presentation this evening. Thanks everyone to, for joining us. Uh, please don't forget to fill in the feedback survey, which will come on your screens after we close the broadcast this evening. And also thanks again to Janssen Australia for their sponsorship of tonight's webinar. And on that note, I will uh, bid everyone uh, a good evening. And don't forget, uh, rattle your bones day on October 31st, and our next webinar will be on the 11th of November. So Marie, many thanks again to you and good night, everyone. Thank you, Jen. Thanks for all your work. Thank you. Thank you. Good on you. Bye.